This is the Reviewing Network Live, a weekly stream of consciousness recording session where I sit back with you folks out there, talk about some of the big news stories from the past week, and some other things i found that might be of amusement to you out there. I think you might get a kick out of it. Now, these are more like audio podcasts and are much longer than my usual videos and are also, for the most part, unedited and will contain some foul language. So, if you're easily offended by that, I advise you to maybe step back a bit, maybe go somewhere else, but, um, but hey, if you're up to the challenge, sit back. Relax and enjoy the show. Thanks. And for the 51st time ever, we are live. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Reviewing Network Live. Unlike last week, when there was so much going on in terms of what I was doing with the Steel City Con and all the stuff coming out of D23, this week was not as eventful. There wasn't a whole lot of big news stories in the world of entertainment, but I did find enough stuff to cover this week, so we're going to get into that type of stuff. Uh, we're also going to cover some stories that I wanted to bring up because they were related to stories that happened in the earlier in the week, and uh, we'll eventually, like I said, we'll eventually get to those stories as we move along here. But um, it's Sunday night; it's another, it's the end of another week, and we move on to the, and we move on to talk about the, the top five as we usually do to start the show off. And um, I'll just say it, this week was actually kind of surprising for a couple of reasons. Uh, Basically, with what the sandwich, basically their sandwich between number one and number five. I thought that the, what the number one movie and the number five movie did were very interesting because one of those movies did more money than I think anybody possibly could have expected. The three movies in between two, three, and four, kind of where you expect they'd be at. But um, let me show you what I'm talking about. Or let me tell you what I'm talking about. Show you. But um, let's go ahead and get to it. Uh, let's start with the number five movie, which this one kind of came out of nowhere. Honestly, the number five movie. The Coraline 15th Anniversary re-release. This was a thing that Fathom Events did. I think they did it as a one-time thing only. I think it's only for this weekend, if I'm not mistaken. Or maybe it's more than that. Maybe it's a, maybe it's something that's going on for longer than that. But um, but I don't know. Usually these Fathom Events are usually one or two nights during the week. One or two nights. One, one during the weekend and two during the middle of the week. Like on Wednesday or something. But... Evidently, this is playing. This particular re-release is playing all weekend long, and and uh, it did very, very well. Honestly, uh, brought in eight point three million dollars, eight point four million to be exact. Uh, if you want to round it up, eight point four, eight million three hundred ninety-one thousand four seventy-nine. So eight point four million dollars, and brought in eleven point three million dollars in uh, since I guess it opened up on a Thursday, which you know it's really impressive considering that this movie. You know, it's amazing that this movie has had that much of, it's like I mean Coraline's a great movie don't get me wrong but I didn't think it had the lasting power of something like The Night Before Christmas does like you see it every, at least every holiday season but but then again you know it is celebrating its 15th anniversary this week and I just want to I'm going to check right here just to be curious about whether or not this actually is get sticking in theaters for the long hauls or just a limited thing let me just take a look here for a second and it looks like, yeah, yeah, it's going to be sticking around for a little bit here. And uh, like I said, it's unusual. This It's a surprise because nobody really knew about this unless you went to the movie theater and you saw it during the pre previews. But, um, hey, you know what? More power to it. Coraline's a great movie. And uh, maybe this is the start of a new trend that's going to happen. Or they're just... I know it's celebrating its 15th anniversary this year, but... Um, Maybe this will be the start of something like with the Night Before Christmas, where they will they will re-release it every year, heading up into Halloween. And if they do that, I think that'd be a good idea. I think that'd be really cool to see. It has it's had had a couple of re-releases since then. There's one that happened in 2021, which I think was only for I'm looking on here on Box Office Mojo. It was only for the United Kingdom, and then there was one for 2023 last year, which did very well too. It bought it set added seven million dollars. And was only like a two-day thing on that front, so I guess they're expanding on that idea. So, so maybe this will be a return of recurring trend going forward. Maybe this will be something that'll be released around this time every is every August. But um, I don't know. I just found that kind of interesting that it made it all the way into the top five without really much of a marketing push for it. But um, like I said, good on them. Good on them for doing that. So uh, let's go ahead and move on to the number four movie this week, which was number three last week, and that is Twisters. Which brought in 9.8 million dollars this weekend, bringing its gross up to 238.4 
million dollars after five weeks, dropping 34% from last week, bringing its gross up to $333 million worldwide. And, um, and uh, not bad for a movie that's, only, that's also available on Prime Video now, which uh, we, my sister actually watched it, watched it on there, since that, that's how I knew it was already on there. Apparently, Just Pickle Me 4 is already on there as well. Um, yeah, not much more to say about it, except, yeah, Glenn Powell's the way to go, go right now, apparently, so, but, um, and, uh, a movie that I've, I have no real intentions on seeing in a theater, seeing any time soon, because I was not looking forward to it, I didn't like the first Twister, but, um, everyone's saying it's good, and I'm probably gonna be that one person that, it'll probably be like Wonka last year, where everyone says it's a great movie, and, and I just didn't see it, I just don't see it with that movie, but, um, but hey, it's still sticking around. There's not really going to be a whole lot of competition for this or any of the movies in the top five, quite honestly, coming up. But um, but uh, let's get to the rest of the top five here. Number three, uh, It Ends With Us, which brought in $24 million this weekend, bringing its two-week gross up to $97.7 million. Only a 52% drop-off, which is bad, but not. But could have been much worse, considering that it was heavily front-loaded early on. But... Um, 179 million dollars worldwide. This thing barely cost a, couldn't have cost that much money at all. I don't think it really. Took, it's there, either way, it's instant profit from this point going forward for that movie. It did very well, and um, yeah, it's gonna probably do. It's, it's gonna be up there with some of Sony's biggest hits of the year, honestly. So not much more to say about that one. Not much more to say about the number two movie either, which finally dropped down from the number one spot after three weeks. Deadpool and Wolverine, which brought itself up to $29 million this weekend, only dropping 46% from last week, bringing its gross up to $545.8 million. Uh, after four weeks, it's already passed the billion-dollar mark, $1.1 billion. And uh, not much more to say about that one because uh, right now Disney, once again, is dominating the box office. And basically Fox has been helping them doing it too because it's been mostly Fo uh, Fox franchises under 20th Century Studios. This is... Probably that big year that Disney has been finally been. <coughs> Excuse me. Sorry about that. Uh, <laughs> that's something going down the wrong throat there. But um, yeah, this year, this summer has been pretty much helped by the fact that Disney had the 20th Century Studios projects out there. And they have all been big hits. They have dominated much of the summer. I mean, Kingdom of the Planet of the Apes got it started in May. Then Disney had Inside Out 2, which was their own in June. Then Deadpool and Wolverine. And now Alien, and now the number one movie, which I'm, I was about to spoil for you, but I'll get to that right now. Alien Romulus. Uh, the number one movie this weekend brought in $41.5 million. The budget on this was $80 million. If you take worldwide grosses, it's already up to $108.2 million. And keep in mind, this was a movie that was originally supposed to go to Hulu. And they're probably glad they made that decision to bring it to the theaters because... You know, it's already made a hundred mil. It's already made back its budget back with worldwide grosses. And even if it drops off going forward, it should not. It shouldn't hurt them by making them back to the by making back that budget in general. I mean, it should be still be a profitable hit for them because the water mouth is fairly good on it. It's got like a B plus on Cinema Score. It got very good reviews from critics. And as I mentioned in my talking about the movies review, which I just posted up. It's a really good movie for the first two thirds. The third act is where it kind of falls apart a little bit, but it never falls apart to the point where I would say it's a terrible movie by any means. It's still a really good movie. I would still gladly say it's a better. It's I will still say it's a better movie than any of the other Aliens movies that came after Aliens. It's probably my. It's easily the best Aliens sequel we've had since Aliens, which really isn't saying a whole lot. But that's how I feel about it, and I'm glad to see that it did very well. A lot of relative unknowns in this movie doing. Is I think the biggest name in here is Kaylee Spaney, who was just in Civil War. And even then, she hasn't really become a big name as of yet. But we'll see what happens as the year as the years go on. But, you know, they did a very good job of marketing the hell out of this movie, too. The promotions for the movie were very good. The trailers were very good. Having that re-release earlier in the year was really good for them. I mean, what more can you say, man? But Disney and Fo Disney's having a really good year, and it's largely a part due to the films they've acquired in the 20th century Fox trade, Fox purchase, um, I say trade, like it's a bit, it's like they actually traded the assets to them, but no, it's a 20th century studios acquisition, and finally it's starting to come together, I mean, I mean, it's, this has been a very good summer for them, indeed, after the year they had last year, they needed it, man, they really needed it indeed, and, um, that's not to say that everything Disney has done this year has gone great, as we'll talk about a little bit later on here, but, um, 
But we'll delve into that one in just a little bit here. But before we do that, I uh, might as well talk about some of the other movies in here. Um, Harold and the Purple Crayon finally dropped off. I mean, once you take 1,500 theaters away from it, it drops off like a rock, 66%. Uh, $15.7 million after three weeks. Only, it just crossed the $20 million mark, which is about half of its budget. So, yeah, that's not going to do very well. It's certainly going to do a little bit... It'll do at least a little bit better than Borderlands, which cratered big time. 72% drop-off from last week. Uh, $13.5 million worldwide, up to $18.5 million for a movie that cost 100 to $115 million. Yeah, and I just reviewed that movie as well. So if you want to go check that out, check that out on the main channel. I'll leave a link to it uh, somewhere on the, co- on the corner here. If not, just go to the channel. It should be the first video you see up there by the time this goes out. But... Um, uh, anything else in here? No, that's about it. I think next week's kind of a dull, kind of a dead week in general. I think the only big new release that's coming is uh, only a couple. New, there's two a couple new releases: Blink Twice, the Channing Tatum movie directed by Zoe Kravitz, which looks like it could, which could potentially have sleeper potential. Uh, but then there's The Crow with Bill Skarsgård, which could be another big flop for Lionsgate. And then, other than that, that's about it. So. Alien Romulus, Deadpool Wolverine, It Ends With Us, Twisters, even Coraline. It'll probably still be the top... It's, there'll still be... It's, a lot of these movies should still be in the top five next week, but um, we will wait to see what happens on that front. But in the meantime, let's go ahead and get into some stories, and we'll start off with some stories that are not necessarily entertainment-related, but they're stories that are... There's a sto- it's a story that we, uh, that we talked about on last week's show and the continuation of it. So, previously on the Brandon Ayuk debacle... So when we last left the saga last week, we were still kind of stuck in a a holding pattern because it looked like nobody really had a good idea of what was going on here. Uh, local pit, local Pittsburgh sports media in general were getting on a lot of people's nerves because they wouldn't shut up about the possibility of Brandon Ayu coming, and Andrew Filippone couldn't get, is, couldn't just admit that. He doesn't know if he's at, if this team, the Steelers are actually going to get Brandon Ayuk, and still believing that there's still a possibility that he would still be coming. But now, it's one week later, and I think the results have spoken for themselves. Um, a decision has finally been made, in which Brandon Ayuk has essentially, you know, decided that he will be traded to the Steelers, and essentially Andrew Filippone was vindicated, and uh, you know everybody sings Kumbaya and everything is all right with the world. And no, I'm just completely kidding with you. Nothing has changed. In the last week, literally nothing. We are still stuck in the same place that we've been stuck in since last week. There's still a debate on whether or not Brandon Ayuk is either going to go to Pittsburgh or he's going to stay in San Francisco. But now, that if there's any updates we have now, it's that the update is that nothing really has been updated since since back in the spring. But we're now just hearing about it now, essentially, because now. Because now we're getting the national media in play here with the situation with Brandon Ayuk. You know, you have Adam Schefter and uh, Ian Rappaport, the head NFL insider for ESPN and NFL Network, getting into the swing of things. And, of course, NFL Network has its many insiders who can who can be more direct with the NFL teams in general. And, uh, yeah, so what have they got to say about this whole situation? Let's take a listen, shall we? So let's start by taking a trip back to last uh, Saturday. And uh, this was from Ian Rappaport on NFL Game Day Kickoff talking about where the talks between the 49ers and Brandon Ayuk had gone, as I've been at that point. So let's go ahead and take a listen to this. There's been a lot of buzz. In fact, over the last couple of weeks, there's been nothing but Brandon Ayuk buzz. And look, depending on what day it is, and I'm pretty sure today is Saturday, depending on what day it is, you could say he's headed to a different place. At one point, it looked like he was headed to the Cleveland Browns. At another point, maybe the New England Patriots. They made a strong offer as well, both trade and contract, as did the Browns. Browns, now it seems the Pittsburgh Steelers are the most likely destination. They made a strong trade offer, and they have made a strong contract offer to Brandon Ayuk. But I only say most likely destination if he goes anywhere. Because over the course of the last, let's say, 24 to 48 hours, the 49ers have taken maybe a little bit of a different approach than they had over the previous several weeks. They met with Brandon Ayuk. They re-engaged on contract talks to try to bring him back and essentially keep him home. What remains unclear is which direction it is going to go. The Steelers are still in the mix. The 49ers are still in the mix. It is undecided right now who Brandon Ayuk is going to play for. And look, the reality is this has seeped out in news and rumors and whatever to all sorts of other players 
So the fact that Amari Cooper learned via a report from San Francisco that he could have potentially been traded to the 49ers led to this Instagram post, which Amari Cooper never says literally anything. So you know this got to him if he decided to post on Instagram. This is where we all are. It didn't seem like the Browns are in the mix now, but there's been a lot of change. So the Amari Cooper Instagram uh, Instagram uh, post that he's talking about is Amari Cooper saying a thing that a black screen that simply just says "LOL, I wouldn't mind at all." As he would have been more, assuming that he would have been more than willing to accept a trade over to San Francisco, but Brandon Ayuk was the one that turned that down essentially. So that was on that was last Saturday. So let's fast forward to let's fast forward to when was the thirteenth? I think that was Tuesday, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, it was Tuesday. Uh, so the latest updates from Tuesday, and this is again from Rappaport, and um, let's see if I can find it here. So that's Monday. Here it is. So this was a tweet from Rappaport on Tuesday. The Steelers and 49ers have a deal of a potential trade, and Pittsburgh is in good place on an IU contract, sources say. If San Francisco gives the final sign-off, it's done. San Francisco has an offer out to IU. Got a long-term deal for him to say he hasn't accepted. So this, so not really much of an update in general here, but essentially, it's it basically says that the Steelers and the 49ers have a deal in place if Brandon Ayuk doesn't accept the offer from the 49ers, which should be simple enough. Of course, Pittsburgh sports media went crazy on that, that thinking that they were going to get Brandon Ayuk. But then later on that evening. On the insiders on NFL Network, Mike Garofalo uh, came in on the conversation here and added a little piece to the conversation that we kind of already knew already going into the going into that first uh, tweet first tweet from Andrew Filipponi and but um, uh, just to reiterate, here's Mike Garofalo on the situation. I'm gonna this, this situation has been uncomfortable. Uh, it's been contentious. It's still a little bit of both of those as we sit here right now, at least between Brandon Ayuk and the 49ers. I'm going to try to inject a little bit of optimism here because you talked about that Instagram post the other night, Tom, where Ayuk said that there are two options. Let's just pick one, right? I dug into that a little bit, and what I've been told is that Brandon Ayuk would prefer to stay with the 49ers and has always preferred to stay with the 49ers, all things being equal. Now, they haven't been equal. But they did make that offer. In fact, both sides sent proposals within the last, I don't know, a couple days, week or so. And the 49ers number has gotten better than what it was previously. And they have, from my understanding, they have agreed on a lot of the main points of the deal. Their offers are in line. But it sounds like there's just one more thing that needs to be ironed out. And if that thing gets ironed out, Brandon Ayuk signs the deal. He stays with the 49ers. He drops the trade request. And finally, we can put this situation behind him, behind him, the Niners can put it behind him. Look, they did the fourth quarter comeback with, with Debo Samuel before when he had the trade request. This would be like, I don't know, like Montana to John Taylor, that kind of last-second type comes, but it can happen. It has happened before. Thank you. Trying to keep the theme going. Look, as, you know, we've talked about leverage, the balls in whose court. As far as Ayuk is con- concerned, it sounds like the ball's in the 49ers' court, and he's hoping that they can just make the final adjustment and get this thing done and stay with the Niners. We'll see. Yeah. No shit the 49ers have the ball in their court because they're the ones who currently have Ayuk under contract. Which I don't think some of the people here in Pittsburgh, the local media guys, like the people at ninety three seven, the fan, or the NF or the NFL insiders in quotes, there is with the Steelers. No, I'm not talking about the, the national NFL insiders. I'm talking about the local insiders, like Andrew Filipponi, Chris Muller, those type of people. Like I don't think they understand that the 49ers have complete control of the situation here because they have Ayuk under contract, and essentially from everything that has been sounding on this whole thing. The 49ers are much closer than than ever to potentially getting Brandon Ayuk to stick around with them, and uh, it's been something that's just been continuing to ex- to keep g- growing and growing as the weeks gone on. That the optimism is that Ayuk's going to sign back in San Francisco, which has basically put Pittsburgh into like a into a depression already. Is that the the Steelers pl- the Steelers playing in the preseason hasn't done that already? I'll get to that in a second because Jesus Christ, that's been rough to watch. This is this has been a rough preseason to watch, but um. But then again, this whole situation here 
is ridiculous. Is is tough to watch as well because, let's be honest, if the let's just be absolutely honest about this whole situation. If the if the Steelers went to a trigger happy to get rid of Deontay Johnson just two days before free agency began, or, or free agency week in general, right now he probably is a Steeler right now. But no, they got rid of him because how dare they question the future of the Steelers going for, forward and. So we're going to send you to the worst place ever in Carolina. You're going to spend the rest of your career there. And then watch. And then watch. Mid-season, he gets traded to Kansas City. And then, yeah, you just sent him to the best team in the football. You, know, you just forced your, one of your best players over to the best team in the NFL. I mean, it's just like uh, – but again, back to Brandon Ayuk. The whole situation is getting so ridiculous right now. Like, it literally is getting to the point where it's just like – we're just tired of it right now. It's just like, like give us a like, just give us a straight answer. Is he put? Is is, is Brandon Ayuk going to sign the deal or not? Because right now the biggest holding th- holding pattern, the biggest holding situation in there that I'm seeing is that, and they've been saying is that, uh, it's the last year of the contract. It's the last year of the contract that the 49ers are trying to negotiate with Brandon Ayuk. He wants a three-year deal, and they want to put him up for a four-year deal, which means less money for him. And, and I mean, if they're, I mean, they're doing everything they can to try to keep this together in general. And I would not be shocked at all if they found a way to just do, to just sign him already, because right now there is literally nothing that I see from this team is from the, is from this 49ers team that's willing to say we're willing to get rid of Brandon Ayuk immediately. Like, even the Steelers are willing to send them second and third round picks to the 49ers for Brandon Ayuk. They still won't do that. And, like, like, I don't know. I don't know if there's some... I don't know if this is John Lynch's secret revenge against Mike Tomlin or something for the time he was in Tampa Bay or something, but like, the way I see it, there's three possibilities of what's going to happen. One, Brandon Ayuk signs the deal with the 49ers. And uh, it's, it's the 49ers have all the leverage here. The Steelers really do not have any leverage, especially since it sounds like the last deal that they put in was a deal they put in months ago. Because like nothing really has is because really nothing has changed that I'm seeing from the last time that, the last time that they were talking about this. Like supposedly nothing really has changed in terms of the offer in hand of what they want to get here. Two, the Steelers end up trading for Ayuk and basically give Brandon Ayuk what he wants and essentially puts themselves in in a possible area where people like Najee Harris, Pat Fryer move don't resign on those long contracts and you essentially risk the, risk the chance of losing all those guys in free agency next year. Even guys that have been there for the longest time like Cam Hayward. Like, there's that possibility too. Or the 49ers can be extremely petty and dickish by simply just telling the 49ers for- is by simply just keeping Brandon Ayuk there. He doesn't sign the contract, but they put him under the franchise tag and essentially just keep him there. Just keep he Brandon Ayuk simply holds out. He does the same thing that Le'Veon Bell did a couple years ago, and basically just sits at, sits out until he gets the contract that he deserves. Or and the 49ers just don't even bother playing him until and or even not trade him until the trade deadline, which could then open the door for teams like the Cleveland Browns, the New England Patriots, the Washington Commanders. You know, teams that were literally going to go after Ayuk and had deals in place, they could be back in play here, and so the Steelers would be shit out of luck on that front too. Or Ayuk just simply doesn't play in twenty twenty four. He t- does the same thing that Le'Veon Bell does, and just walks it, and just and just not plays, and, t- and just becomes a free agent the following year. I feel like that's like there's no real situation here where I see the Steelers getting is getting Ayuk in the future. Which honestly, if you've been watching the preseason. Who knows if that's actually a good thing in general? Because my God, I mean, this team looks terrible. And I know it's the preseason. I know it really doesn't matter, but there has not been a whole lot from this team that I've seen in these two games in the pre- in the preseason that has given me any hope that this team is going to be the Super Bowl contender that everybody says they're going to be. Yeah, especially with the O line. The O line has looked horrible. Like Broderick Jones. You know, they, the first round pick pick from last year, who looked pretty good last year, and then all of a sudden you move him to the you moved him as a right tackle instead of a left tackle that he was supposed to be, and Gregory Rousseau shreds him not once, not twice, not three times, but four times in a row yesterday, and he gets to Russell Wilson, and Russell I don't even blame the 
Russell Wilson for having not as much of a good game. It doesn't help when your own line can't help can't protect you as they're supposed to do. You spent a, the Steelers invested a lot of money in this O line and a lot of draft capital in this O line, but it doesn't help when you have a lackluster offensive coach in Pat Meyer, who apparently is not good at his job whatsoever because it's because there's no is because there's no way that this team can get any better. You know, when you have to start facing starter-caliber defenses, and it's just it's just baffling. It's just baffling how bad this whole thing has gone in general. And it also doesn't help that Mike Tomlin is getting really cocky with his decisions. Like, like there were so many opportunities to get field, to get touchdowns in these first two preseason games, and he decides not to do it. Just is or field goals or points that actually keep you in the game in general. I know it's the preseason. I know these games aren't going to matter for, for most people, but this is a completely revamped football team and has a completely new offense altogether, which pretty much looks like the same offense Matt Canada was running back in the day, is back the year before. So, yeah, this is why I was worried about them hiring Arthur Smith as the offensive coordinator because so far, that dude has not shown anything different that I saw from last, year, year's, te- last year's offense in general. They have they've barely reached the end zone, and when they had, they've been, they've either been down significantly or just haven't done anything of noteworthiness whatsoever. It's just I'm just not I'm just not sure about this football team going into the season. And yeah, there's one more preseason game coming up on Saturday against the Lions, which I mean it's going to be mostly the backups who are still trying to stay stay on the football team, but. I don't even know if this. I don't even know if Mike Tomlin even knows what kind of a football team he's going to have on the field against Atlanta. I'm dreading doing that live watch on su- on that Sunday because I don't know if I'm going to be able to keep my mind focused and and not wanting to go kill, not wanting to go, go on a killing spree after. Is if the preseason is any indication? And no, I'm not going to go on a killing spree. It's just like I'm flabbergasted by this team right now and how just just off they are. And I know everyone is saying it's the preseason. Calm down. It's going to get better. Yeah, the Steelers have had bad preseasons in seasons when they've made the playoffs. But those were, those were preseasons when they made the playoffs without ben, with Ben Roethlisberger there. This is a completely new Steelers team in general. And I don't even know who, if the Steelers are really, really sure of where their direction is going going forward. I certainly don't think it's going to include Brandon Ayuk because I think he saw what happened in the last two games. He's just like, you know what? I think I think I'm just comfortable saying in San Francisco. That'd be me. That'd be me if I was Brandon Ayuk. But um, but um, yeah. So the bottom line of this whole thing is, is that this debacle is never going away. It's now been two weeks since Andrew Filipponi, uh put those tweets out saying that the Steelers were indeed going to get Brandon Ayuk, and has never happened since. And if you want me to be completely honest with you. I'd say skip, skip on Brandon and I. You can just bring back Juju Smith-Schuster and Chase Claypool. I mean, they were both released by the Patriots and Bills. They know the system. They certainly be better options than spending a ton of money on these wide receivers that probably won't stick around for the entirety of their contracts. And still, and still, they see me as the crazy one for thinking that, but I'm sorry. That's just the way I feel right now. And, yeah, so... So bottom line here is that the Brandon Ayuk debacle continues. It will probably continue into its third week where we'll probably get no real significant news, but they'll make it seem like it's big significant news on certain aspects. But I sincerely doubt it. I think we're just stuck in a... I think we're just stuck just like the Steelers are stuck right now. And, you know, before you focus on bringing in Brandon Ayuk, focus on fixing your offensive line. Focus on fixing your team for the regular season because at this point... I'm really cautiously scared that this Steelers team is going to be one of the worst teams in the NFL this year. It just has that feeling. Like, I just, I sense no real optimism except for a few little bright spots here and there, but they're very tiny bright spots in order for me to think that this team's going to be any better than, I th- than it is right now. But, but that's just my take on it. So, uh, that was not the only big, only notable news in the NFL this past week. Uh, let's talk about some other news that happened this week. So there was a story that kind of wasn't really a big story in general, but just an idea from somebody, and um, that idea was from Colin Kaepernick, who I don't think I need to tell you about him in general, if you've been following the news in the last, what, six, seven years in general, and how he was essentially blackballed out of the NFL uh, for reasons that are kind of stupid in general, but he made the news this week by talking about potentially coming back to playing in the NFL. This is from CNN. Former San Francisco 49ers quarterback Colin Kaepernick said he hopes to still play in the NFL again. 
Kaepernick, 36, recently told Sky Sports he's still training and pushing for a return to the league. But there could be a place for him off the field if he chooses. Los Angeles Chargers head coach Jim Harbaugh, who was also blackballed by the 49ers, by the way, and I added that in there, told USA Today shortly after he, he was hired in January that he offered Kaepernick a non-player role. Harbaugh said the quarterback is considering the offer, but the two haven't reconnected since then. Such a role could be an assistant coach or consultant. Kaepernick hasn't been signed by an NFL team since becoming a free agent in 2017. His sideline status in the league follows... Fo- protest he's inspired in 2016 against police brutality of black people by kneeling during the national anthem at games. Kaepernick sued the NFL for collusion and ended up receiving an undisclosed settlement with the league. And then he went on to be beca- and then he went on to use that money to more than likely to more than likely help the cause that he was going to do, but also have some time to do promotions for Nike and promote a Ben and Jerry's ice cream called Change the World. Yes, that is a hundred percent real. There is a Ben and Jerry's ice cream for Colin Kaepernick. Nick called change the world and like I co- like we still sell it too it's not like it's not, it's not like it's been something that's been out for what been away for a long time now though we still sell it to this very day but um but in the last couple of days there has been an update on the Harbaugh to offer and essentially that Kaepernick will not be on the staff this year and uh, he says that I love Colin but he's not going to be on the coaching staff which is set for this year and he's not going to be playing on the roster either Harbaugh, who coached Kaepernick in San Francisco from 2011 to 2014, told USA Today Sports earlier this week that he reached out to Kaepernick about joining his Chargers staff shortly before and after being named, shortly after being named coach on January 24th. Harbaugh said on Thursday it wasn't the first time he had touched base with Kaepernick about coaching, and that he mentioned it a couple times when he was at the coach at Michigan. Kaepernick returns 37 on November 3rd. Has not played in an NFL game since January 1st, 2017. So basically. Basically recapping everything I told you in the first article there, which honestly, at this point for Colin Kaepernick to play again in the the league, I think that ship has sailed, man. Like, yeah, it sucks what happened to you. What after you is after what, you basically didn't really do anything that bad, except you're you, you were trying to you were trying to speak for a, something that is critical and, and important that's happening in the world, but unfortunately you were doing it in an era that was run by a. Go- was where the president was Donald Trump, and everybody is trying to use that as a political standpoint, and basically you were blackballed out of the league because of that. And, yeah, it sucks that he never got the opportunity to do it again, but that ship has sailed for him to come back and play. Now, if he wants to come back and coach, I think most people would be behind that. I think that he has a lot to teach young people as a young people in terms of how to play the game. And he was a really good quarterback, and he led, I mean, he led them to the Super Bowl in 2012, and, but... Yeah, the whole idea of having these older guys playing playing quarterback at, at their age that they are right now, not everybody can be Tom Brady. Not everybody can be Aaron Rodgers. Not everybody can be Brett Favre or, you know, Joe Namath or, or uh, Joe Montana or, or um, Philip Rivers, Drew Brees, Matt Ryan. Like, like most quarterbacks nowadays, like, those older quarterbacks don't really – it's like it's not really that it's not really that easy to just come back in and play like you did before, especially with a guy like Colin Kaepernick, who hasn't played in the league for seven years. Like, I never really bought into the whole idea that he could come back and play for, for play football again as a quarterback. But like I said, if he if he co- comes back and coaches, that wouldn't be a bad idea. I would not be against, I don't think anybody would be against that idea at all. I mean. He has a lot. You could. He has a lot to teach kids in general. Teach these young, the young kids in general and the young football players in general. And um, yeah, if he wanted to come back and coach, I don't. I don't think anybody would be honestly against that. But maybe, maybe curveball the idea of coming back to play as QB at your age right now because yeah, it's been not only your age but the fact that it's been way too long since you've been out of the league. Remember when? Remember when Urban Meyer was the head coach of the Jacksonville Jaguars and he brought Tim Tebow out of retirement to play tight end. Do you see how well that lasted? Only one game? Yeah. Yeah, that's just um, that's just something that I would just put the kibosh on as coming back to play quarterback. Coaching? Possibility. I, wouldn't be, I would not be surprised if he becomes a coach down the road, but not as a, not as a quarterback in the league. So. so that is that. Let's go. But now let's head into some entertainment news because there was some news to get into in terms of movie news in general, starting off with the latest film from James Wan. Not a lot of big news in Hollywood, but there were some notable stories in particular, and one of the big ones that came out very early on was that the creature from the Black Lagoon is coming back, as the Hollywood Reporter has the story here. James Wan, the creator of Saw and the Conjuring horror franchises, is developing a new take on the classic Universal monster property in early early talks to direct the feature project. 
The move comes as one of his collaborators presented Universal with a pitch to remake the 1954 monster classic. A writer will now be hired to write a script working in co- concert with Juan. This is the first project Juan has attached himself to a director as following the, his production company's banner Atomic Monster merging with Blumhouse. Juan was underwater for the last few years on DC super mo- superhero movie Aquaman and the Lost Kingdom as we're looking to get back to his horror roots in some way. Juan will act as a producer on Creature while att- Atomic Monster's Michael Clear and Judson Scott serve as executive producers. The black and white movie made in the gimmicky and popular 3D format told of a prehistoric water breathing humanoid monster and a group of scientists that wanted to study him. He was among the last of the Universal's great movie monsters, combining an entrancing mix of horror, tragedy, and romance that introduced audience to the unique gill man, aka the creature, who was the last of his kind. Jack Arnold, who has helped sci-fi classes such as The Incredible Shrinking Man, directed the movie that features Julie Adams as the movie as the woman who caught the cat creature's eye. Hollywood has been trying to bring back creatures since the 1980s when John Landis tried to produce an iteration, while John Carpenter and even Ivan Reitman developed takes in the 1990s. Gary Ross took it on in the 2000s, intent on following in his father's footsteps. Arthur A. Ross co-wrote the script and de- as did Breck Eisner. More recently, the u- character was to have been part of Universal's Dark Universe monster movies in the 2010s with Will Beale writing the installment. The Dark Universe initiative eventually imploded as the studio focused on a more filmmaker-centric approach. Wants take is described as a being a grounded, more modernized retelling that will lead into visceral horror while still paying respect to the original. So, if you saw what they did with the Invisible Man and what they're going to do coming up with the uh, the Wolf Man, um, this should not really be a surprise in general here. I mean, I mean, Blumhouse honestly should be the studio that should be helping to bring back the monster universe in general, and I think they're gonna. I, th- I think they have a pretty good chance to make it work. It just depends on what they're going to do. With, uh, with this Wolfman remake coming out, we already saw what they did with The Invisible Man, which I thought was a very good film in general. Uh, if, you don't do this, if you don't do The Creature from the Black Lagoon in the same way that you did with The Exorcist and Halloween, then I think you pretty much have, your, have a possibility of making this really damn good in the process. But then again, Mike Flanagan's taking over The Exorcist series from this point forward, so we'll see what happens there. Hopefully it'll lead to better things going forward. Not much more to say about this story in general, so let's go ahead and move on to... Our next story that we have here, and it involves Nicolas Cage. In a role that you probably never expected him to play, but, um... But yeah, this is apparently happening. Uh, this again comes from The Hollywood Reporter. After months, if not years, in development, David O. Russell's Madden looks like it's heading towards the end zone. Nicolas Cage is set to play John Madden, the storied football coach and sports commentator in a drama by Amazon MGM Studios, to be directed by David O. Russell, the filmmaker, of course, behind Silver Linings Playbook and American Hustle. Here's the catch, though. This is not a biopic of the man in the typical way, nor a sports drama, a a drama Russell took on with the boxing movie The Fighter. Rather, Madden is in part, according to sources, a video game movie. It is the origin story of Madden NFL, one of the biggest video game franchises of all time. How convenient, because Madden 25 comes out this week, and I just so happen to got my copy, and uh, you can hear it right there. Trust me, it's Madden 25. You really want more proof of it? Here, I'll show you. Hey, there, I had to go. I had to come on camera for this. So there you go, Madden 25 in my hand. So, and, yeah, so I put that back in there, and make sure none of them fall out. Okay, moving on. Okay, <laughs> sorry about that. The feature hails from Prime Sports original feature film produced by. D- by Todd Black. That's literally how it says on here. This fe- the feature hails from Prime Sports original feature film produced by Todd Black. That's literally how it says in the in the article. Also producing are Escape Artists Jason Blumenthal, Steve Tisch, and Jonathan Shukat, alongside Russell and Matthew Bugman. Escape Artists is currently in prep on a live-action adaptation of Masters of the Universe for Amazon. Madden was the head coach of the Oakland Raiders in the 1970s with an inviolable winning streak. He parlayed that into a three-decade-long career as a color commentator, becoming part of the American pop culture landscape. With his entertaining style, he won 16 Emmy Awards along the way. In the 1980s, he began conversations with electronic artists to create what would become Madden NFL, the game series that launched in 1988 and continues to the present day. For many, in fact, the man is more synonymous with the game than the broadcasting or coaching. Russell wrote the script, working on an earlier version by Cambon Clark. So, this seems like it's right for a movie version about about the about the man in general, of John Madden. But Nicolas Cage, though, even if you even if it is about the video game in general, 
you look at you look at Nicolas Cage and John Madden, and none of one of them really look alike in general. But then again, the power of makeup can really do a lot for him. Maybe, maybe Nicolas Cage gains a couple of pounds. But um, I don't know. I mean, it, it's very interesting. It's an interesting idea in general. And you know, Amazon MGM had a hit earlier uh, last year with um the Ben Affleck movie Air, which was a movie about the making of the Air Jordan shoes and did a good job of doing a movie about Michael Jordan without having Michael Jordan in there. So, uh, and David O. Russell can be a good director. He's been on kind of a roll as of late, but maybe this is an opportunity for him to get back on track. So I'm cautiously optimistic about this. It seems like an interesting idea in general to do a movie about the making of the video game itself. But, um... My only real problem with it is the casting of Nicolas Cage and how he's going to look like John Madden. It's going to be very, very hard to do. But hey, like I said, stranger things have happened, and maybe it could work in the long run. But um, but we'll wait to see what happens. Assuming it actually gets as close as it can, because it looks like they're it looks like they're getting closer and closer to making this a reality. So I'll definitely check it out when it comes out. Certainly, but um, I'm really interested and cautious to see what they'll do with that with that in general in terms of what they'll do to make Nicolas Cage look like John Madden because I feel like it's going to be a very tough task to do but we will wait to see what happens when we get to that point in time but uh, with that said moving on to story number three so this one wasn't really as mentioned as much as I think it probably should have been because it's a notable motion picture in history that has never seen the light of day but Deadline Hollywood reported the story this week that the script for the, the infamous Jerry Lewis Holocaust tale the Day the Clown dr- Cried has been resurrected and is now looking to potentially finally getting ma- made into a motion picture, into, um, which I thought it was already fi- made, but never re- it was already made but never finished for for some reasons here. I want to get into it when I read the story here. This is from Deadline Hollywood, who is really the only company I saw that actually posted the story up here. I didn't see anything on Variety or the Hollywood Reporter, but but this is Deadline Hollywood putting the story out here, and it says. The Day the Clown Cried is getting another chance at the big screen. Rewritten by Jerry Lewis, who starred in and directed a 1972 feature drama that went unfinished and unreleased, the script for The Holocaust Tale is being revived by K-Jam media founder Kia Jam. Jam has been a part of the financing and producing of films ranging from The Killing Game to In the Heart of the Sea, Sin City A Dame to Kill For, and numerous others. Jam said he executed a purchasing agreement on the original script by Joan O'Brien and Charles Denton. Lewis took a hand in reshaping it as an as reshaping it as a starring and directing vehicle, Jam is going back to the original screenplay. He says he has the production finance, producing financing, production financing, good lord, and the next step is to secure a filmmaker with the guts to tell a more harrowing story. Lewis disavowed the film and did his best to make sure it never got released, probably because of a combination of rights issues and an outcry over the audacity of the iconic comic actor setting a film in the concentration camps involving the deaths of Jewish children at the hands of the Nazis in World War II. He was accused of unabashedly chasing an Oscar. You know, heaven forbid if somebody, if an actor actually tries to chase an Oscar and uh, succeeds at it. I mean, it's not like that hasn't happened in the 50 plus years since then, but, um, but I digress. Lewis starred as Helmut Dork, a failing German circus clown long past the days when he was a famous performer touting North America and and Europe as part of the Ringling Brothers Circus. Things get worse when he is overheard drunkenly mocking Hitler in a bar. He's turned over to the Gestapo and imprisoned in a Nazi camp for political prisoners. There he finds an outlet for his talents, entertaining the suffering Jewish children who are segregated in a part of the camp. After suffering numerous beatings from engaging the children, the clown is used by the camp commandment as a Pied Piper to help load the children on boxcars to Auschwitz. He winds up on a passenger, a passenger on that train, and in a selfless act, unusual for the previously selfless old clown, he escorts off the children to their deaths and is himself killed. For an unreleased film, The Day the Clown Cried has a mythology rare in the annals of film, to a point a documentary in the film and its undoing called From Darkness to Light will premiere at the upcoming Venice Film Festival. Lewis made the film when he was squarely known for comedy, well before he turned in lo- loud and dramatic performances in films like Martin Scorsese's The King of Comedy. That and the subject matter led to press coverage largely covered by derision. Since then, multiple Holocaust movies have drawn acclaim by telling stories of courage and the unbelievable cruelty surrounded by Hitler's, Hitler's Nazi Germany. 
Those films range from the most recent Oscar-winning The Zone of Interest by Jonathan Glazer to Steven Spielberg's Oscar-winner Schindler's List. Roberto Benigni's Oscar-winning Life is Beautiful, The Barry Levinson directed Ben Foster starred The Survivor, The Mark Kerman directed The Boy in the Striped Pajamas, The Rob Williams starred Jacob the Liar, The Taika Waititi directed Jojo Rapid, Quentin Tarantino's Inglorious Bastards, The Mick Jackson directed Denial starring Rachel Wise and numerous others. All are hard stories by gutsy directors who importantly kept alive the memory of a dark moment in history filled with genocide and cruelty. Though it has turned into an obsession that led him to spend years cleaning up the rights, Jam's entry into The Day the Clown Cried began with a chance meeting in a hallway with a rabbi. And he's talking about the the situation with the rabbi that he talked about. It's very long paragraphs. I will not delve into the I will not delve into all of that, but it's a film that sounds it sounds really interesting and really odd, like kind of a mix between, it's like Patch Adams meets the, meets World War II, which sounds like it could be an interesting idea, except that Patch Adams was actually a good movie, but I don't know. I don't know how I would feel about this movie getting made. I mean, there's a possibility it could work. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, maybe if you got a good writer, maybe if you got a good director to make it work, but... I don't know. I don't know. I really don't know how to feel about this movie actually getting made. If it actually does eventually get made, which, you know, they could be talking about this and then it never gets made in general. But um, I don't know. Like, it's definitely something that if it's if it's done, could be very interesting to see. It could open the door for some of these other cursed projects in general to finally get moving. Like, um, a took is one of those big ones that that everyone's been trying to get made, but everyone that tries to make it ends up dying dying or suffering these cr- catastrophic injuries or a confederacy of dunces and another cursed project. So, um, I don't know. It also, it's just, like I said, it just depends on who they get to write and direct, to rewrite and direct this movie in general. But, um, if it's done well, it could make for a very interesting movie in general. I think because of movies like Schindler's List and Life is Beautiful and all these mo- movies about the Holocaust that we've had since the fi- since that movie was made... I think there is more than likely a, a more sense of an optimism to get the, get a movie like this out there, and I'm hoping that is, I'm hopeful that maybe this could actually work out in the film's favor, make it actually get made. But again, it's all going to depend on who you're going to get to re- direct it. If you get a, if you get a real good director, if you get a real good studio behind it, then maybe there's a possibility it could work. But I don't know. It's it's a tough situation to talk, to really digest into here. But I'm cautiously optimistic to see if this works. But I don't th- I don't know if it's actually going to actually get made. But if it does. I'd be interested to definitely check it out indeed. So so that's that. Let's go ahead and move on to some stories revolving the Mouse House. You know, last week we spent a lot of the time praising them for their stuff that they were announcing at D23. Now we're going to go ahead and bash the shit out of them for some of the stuff they've been doing this week. Because let's just say there's been a lot of scumbaggery going on at Disney as of late. So yeah, kind of like like I said before, the opposite of last week happening with Disney. Everyone was talking about how Disney... They were excited to see what was coming from Disney with everything from D23. And then this week we've got the complete opposite of that, which, you know what, it basically just goes to show that for all the great stuff that Disney has done, you can also make for, you can also trash them for being kind of a sc- for scumbaggy things that they do, kind of like what you can do with Warner Brothers. But, yeah, they did a couple of things this week that make you go, like, really? You do, you're doing that? Like, why are you doing that? Like... Uh, one of the first things that came out right from the get-go was the story from The Hollywood Reporter about the firing of Bo DeMeo. Now, if you remember back in March, he was fired from X-Men 97 before the show be- premiered and eventually became the hit that it was. And, you know, he le- is he was fired from the show and nobody really knew exactly what exactly happened. But um, but the ho- but this week, uh, but, but DeMeo came out on Thursday and claimed what was happening with the show and Marvel shot right back at it, and I've got the full story here from The Hollywood Reporter. This is a story that starts off with, this, with, a, with a five months after Marvel Studios fired X-Men 97 creator Bo DeMeo for mysterious reasons, the writer claimed Thursday that he no longer will get credit on the second season of the hit Disney Plus show, which he completed work on before his exit. DeMeo made the claim on social media saying it was part of a troubling pattern he endured while working at Marvel. Marvel shot back soon after and in a statement to The Hollywood Reporter gave insight that his firing setting it occurred after an internal investigation revealed egregious findings. Above is, ex- is hashtag X-Men fan art I posted on Instagram for Gay Pride in June. On June 13th, Marvel sent a letter notifying me that they stripped me from my Season 2 credits due to the post. They wrote, Mayor wrote on X on Thursday, along with an illustration of a shirtless version of himself as the superhero Cyclops. 
DeMeo, who spent several years at Marvel working on a draft on a long gestating Blade feature as well as the TV series Moon Knight, added, Sadly, this is the latest in a troubling pattern I suffered through while on working on X-Men 97 and Blade. Marvel responded by saying that DeMeo's behavior was the cause of his firing and for him losing his credits. Mr. DeMeo was, deter- was terminated in a March 24th following an internal investigation, said a Marvel spokesperson in the statement. Given the egregious nature of the findings, we severed ties with him immediately, and he has no further affiliation with Marvel. Sources say that following his exit, ex- an, an agreement was reached between the two parties over the issue of tweeting about the show, something that DeMeo has continued to occasionally do. In light of the breaches, his credit from Season 2 was removed. While no details of the cause of termination or the internal reviews have surfaced, sources say it involves sexual misconduct, which, yeah, okay, so that's that's pretty much something that's been unfortunately kind of the norm in the last couple of years, unfortunately. So uh, DeMeo did not immediately return a request for comment. DeMeo was an avid social member user during his tenure at Marvel, sharing X-Men tidbits as well as shirtless pics of himself, and even running a non-explicit OnlyFans account. This all led to the LGBTQ publication out to declare him the sexiest gay, the sexy gay Marvel writer and showrunner to know. On the, on the surface, the notion that Marvel would strip DeMeo for credit due to a social media post would stretch credulity as an outsider's observance the note Note the gay pride illustration is similar to any number of posts he made while employed at Marvel. And fired Marvel executive Victoria Alonso remains credited on projects he's previously worked on following her exit in 2023. But the reveal of an internal investigation points to deeper causes. Despite the bad press around DeMeo's firing, X-Men 97 went on to become a hit with audiences and critics, earning Marvel Studios its first 100% score on Rotten Tomatoes and garnering DeMeo an Emmy nom for the episode Remember It. Marvel teased Season 2 at D23, while the studio tapped Matthew Chauncey to write Season 3 following DeMeo's firing. Until now, DeMeo has remained mostly mumless on his firing from Marvel, though in recent days he did note that he tried and failed to secure a seat at the Emmys from the studio. Concluded DeMeo in his initial post on Thursday, I'll have more to say soon, but must take a step back from social media to find a safer space for me to be out proud and nerdy. Stay tuned. But after the internal publica- initial publication of the article, he reacted to Marvel's statement writing, the truth will be revealed after their Disney Plus disaster. Marvel wants to mislead with alleged contract breaches over tweets. It's tragic it's come to this, but unsurprising. Stay tuned. And on Friday, veteran attorney Brian Freeman revealed that he had taken on DeMeo as a client and then a statement to the Hollywood Reporter said in part, Having much experience with Disney, the playbook is always the same. Family friendly on the outside, but secretly a plenty, attempting to plant illegal, cons- unconcilable uncons- items in contract. Acts that silence the truth and stop the employee customers from asserting basic constitutional rights. As we will explain through detailed examples, which we will roll out in detail one by one, Disney's model is very clear and a repetitive illegal pattern. So, uh, yeah, this is kind of a situation that some people have also said is very similar to what happened with James Gunn. Of course, he got fired for some old tweets that Disney knew about, but they fired him anyway, and then eventually we hired him back for Guardians of the Galaxy 3. So... I don't think it's as, I don't think it's quite as similar to this, and it's definitely something that it would not be surprising if Disney knew, is if with with what Disney has been do, doing as of late with like I said the James Gunn situation or the next story we're going to bring up, which I think is a lot more significant to talk about. But um, but yeah, it's a very odd situation here, and I think a lot of us are very curious to see what's going to happen when all this stuff gets leaked out on. Like, is this stuff that's actually true, or is this stuff that's actually, you know, something that Bo is probably making up? I don't think he would be making it up, per se, but, um, like, I mean, yeah, some people say that you, you could probably make this up because it is something that's with a big company, it's involved with a big company like Disney, but I don't know. I don't think, if, I don't think he'd be just saying this to straight up lie to people, but, um... I'm going to wait to see more information come out on this, because this is something that should be very much interesting to see what happens here, but, um... Yeah, it's um, it's certainly a, the first of many black marks Disney had this particular weekend. But as bad as this is, it's nothing compared to the next story we have here. Because my God, this—you really have to look at this and think to yourself: there's no way that this could be real. But unfortunately, sadly, I think it is what I think it actually is. So I don't have the full details on this particular story. I'm just reading off of Deadline Hollywood at first, but after I read it, I'll go ahead and see if I can find some more details on this, if there's any more to really be get, to do this here. But if you did not hear about this story and you have a free tra- you had a free trial to Disney Plus at some point, settle in because this right here is a trip and a half here. So um, let's just go ahead and read this. This is again from Deadline Hollywood. 
As a widower takes Disney to court over his wife's death at Walt Disney World and Resorts, the company is using its Disney Plus streaming terms to attempt blocking the lawsuit. In a recent filing, Disney's attorneys requested Jeffrey Piccolo's $50,000 claim be dismissed and settle out of court after claiming his wife, Dr. Kenok, Dr. Kenok Porn Tegzulin, I think that's how it's pronounced, died of an allergic reaction at the Florida Resorts, Ra- Resorts Raglan Road Irish Pub in October 2023. They argued that by signing up for a th- th- free 30-day trial of Disney Plus in 2019 and again when purchasing the theme park tickets in 2023 through his Disney Plus account, Piccolo agreed to the streamer's terms of service, which includes that all disputes with the Walt Disney World Company and its affiliates be settled out of court via arbitration. We are deeply saddened by the family's loss and understand their grief, Disney attorney said in a statement shared by The Guardian. Given that the restaurant is neither owned nor operated by Disney, we are merely defending ourselves against the plaintiff's attorney's attempts uh, to include us in the lawsuit against the restaurant. Piccolo's attorney said the argument bordered on the surreal in response, adding, The notion that terms agreed by a consumer when creating a Disney Plus free trial account will forever bar that consumer's right to a jury trial in any dispute with any Disney affiliate or subsidiary is so outrageously unreasonable and unfair as to shock the judicial conscience, and this court should not enforce such an agreement. In ever Walt Disney Parks and Resorts is, in effect, in, is, in exp- is explicitly seeking to bar its 150 D- Disney Plus members uh, Disney Plus subscribers from ever prosecuting a wrongful death case against it in front of a jury, even if the case facts with no- has nothing to do with Disney Plus. So, the argument that you know they could say that you know di- that Raglan Road is neither owned nor operated by Disney—if it had just been that, I could see where Disney was coming from. But the fact that you got to add that plus the fact that, it- but the Disney Plus account thing. That's where I really, that's where it's, that's where I really have to draw the line on this because it's just, it just sounds like, this whole story doesn't even sound like it's real at that point. This feels like a story you would hear on The Onion, like, or or one of those fake parody websites in general. And, um, and, uh, yeah, let me see if I can find the thing about the person that died because there was something I saw where they basically said that, uh, they were basically talking about, the, what it led up to the events of this because it sounds crazy what happened after leading up to the events of this. Okay, I found it here. This is from the US this is from the USA Today article for this. It says that according to the this is the craziest thing about this whole thing. According to the wrongful death lawsuit, Tankson and Piccolo chose the Raglan Road restaurant because it advertised its commitment to accommodating people with allergies. When they were told the when they told the waiter Tang Suen had several allergies to dairy and nuts, she was unequivocally assured that the food would be allergen free, according to the lawsuit. When the orders of broccoli and corn fritters, scallops, and onion rings arrived, they did not have allergen free flags. So Piccolo and Tang Suen inquired again if the food was allergen free, and were told the dishes were safe for Tang Suen to eat. About 45 minutes later, while shopping alone in the nearby store, Tang Suen had a severe allergic reaction. She administered an EpiPen, but began having difficult breathing and collapsed. She was taken to the hospital where she later died. The medical examiner determined her death was a result of anaphy- anaphylaxis due to elevated levels of dairy and nuts in her system. Disney restaurants have strict protocols for food allergies and are known for their attention to allergens. And, uh, yeah, I, I mean, I can attest to this because my, fa- because my mother has allergies and every time we go to a restaurant, especially in Disney, but whenever, whenever we go to one of these restaurants, especially Raglan Road, they're the ones that are always, the, that always say, you know, that she always has to ask them, do you have anything that doesn't have sesame seeds on it? Because my mother's allergic to sesame seeds. And they always, and, you know, they have a th- you know, they give you like the allergy free menu. And so the times we've been there, that's been mostly, but it's been mostly, mo- what you expect for happen, something like this, but this whole thing is so crazy that they didn't even bother to check and make sure that the food was actually safe to eat for this for this person who had all these allergies, who who was severely allergic to dairy and nuts, and it's just like, like this should be an open and shut case right from the get go. It's just like, like if anything, the people who serve them that food should be fired, and they should really be. Like this is the type of thing that they should really look at. We look. They should really do a lot of retraining to these people, for like making sure that you make sure that you you give these people food that doesn't have specific allergies that they tell that they tell you about, is that they have and like, like it's just ins- it's insane. Like this is a ridiculously crazy story, and the fact that the fact that Disney was willing to try to is willing to try to force this out of the out of there because oh because they have a Disney Plus trial. It, 
that doesn't work that way. It's like the it's it would be like saying it would be like saying well you can't sue the pit you can't sue the Pittsburgh Steelers or, or you can't sue the Pittsburgh Steelers because somebody you knew died while they were at, while they were at Acrisure Stadium. It's just like like they didn't even have anything to do with it except the is it should be the stadium you should be sue, suing and the stu, and the Steelers should, it's, it's like it would be like the Steelers would sue the, would sue you because. Of, is because and sue you as a wrongful de- try to take the wrongful death tri- a lawsuit out of there because you have season tickets like that does not that does not work that way that is not how that works and yeah there could be severe ramifications for this if Disney tries to successfully uh, drop this lawsuit which I hope they do not I hope somebody in Flor- at that at the Florida justice system like yeah Florida we can make fun of for their lax laws and all that type of stuff and how they just yet have a terrible governor there Ron DeSantis who like. Like, if I'm on DeSantis, I'd be salivating at this news right now because I would be like, yeah, I'll do whatever it takes to make sure Disney doesn't win this one. They won. Like, but, um, yeah, this is just crazy. This is a crazy, crazy story here. And it's just like, like, the thing that bugs me the most is the whole thing about how they took, is that they ask the waiters, do they have anything with that for people? Is, you know, I'm allergic to dairy and nuts. Okay, let's give you a me- it's usually what they do is give you like an allergy-free menu to make sure that there's stuff on there that you could eat without having to deal with the possibility of allergies, and then to just not give them the food, give them the food that's supposed to not have those allergens to it. Like, like it's like those the people who did, the waiters there should be fired. Whoever did that, but yeah, it's just it's a crazy, crazy story, man. And hopefully, I'm gonna catch up with this as we learn more and more information, but. I really hope that this this doesn't go th- this doesn't get thrown out in arbitration or just gets dismissed altogether because this is just too crazy of a story that it's too crazy of a story to not be true. Like I, w- I would be shocked if this story if this lawsuit gets tossed out. I mean this is just cr- ridiculous. And um, yeah, so yeah, like I said before, you can ma- you can pr- praise Disney for everything that they do, but when they do something wrong like this, you got to call them out on it for, for it. And yeah. I'm sure this is one of those weeks when David Zaslav at Warner Brothers called Bob Iger and say, "Hey, hey, hey, David, Bobby, welcome to the, welcome back to the scumbag party, my friend," because that's what happened last year when this actor strike began. When Bob Iger was talking about how the the strikes were, that were happening were unre- were unreasonable, unfit, unreasonable on television a day after he signed a massive contract extension, where he got more money out of it. So, yeah, like, yeah, this is a crazy story here, but um. Yeah, those are two big stories that should be continuing to be focused on going forward into the future, and we'll definitely keep you up to date on this particular cha- channel here in the in the weeks and months to come when this takes when this continues to take shape. But um, there's one more story coming out of Disney in particular that I want to mention, not be- because of anything bad that happened within the stu- within the studio, just for a project that they did a couple years ago that essentially will mean absolutely moot from this point going forward. So a few years back, the MCU put out a movie called Eternals, which had the benefit of a, of a young, up-and-coming cast with some veteran t- talent in the cast itself, including Salma Hayek and Angelina Jolie and Byron Tyree Henry. It also included uh, Kamal Nanjiani, Richard Madden, Kit Harington, uh, Gemma Chan, and it was directed by uh, Chloe Zeha, who had just won the Oscar for directing uh, Nomadland direct, uh, for Best Director as well as for Best Picture. And so there was a lot of high expectations going into that movie, and most people felt underwhelmed by it for a number of different reasons. And I've talked about it in my review for it, where I thought the first half of the movie was really good, and then the second half of the movie is when it really comes crumbling down. You could tell the second half of the movie was completely rewritten and re reshaped around because of because they did it after COVID nineteen had taken shape, and it definitely shows on screen here. And it did set up possibilities for what they could do down the fu- down the road for the for the MCU with some of the things they were setting up. But I was really looking forward to seeing what they would do with it. But I will say it's definitely one of the worst MCU movies in general. But as long as we got to see all that stuff they were building up for the next movie, uh, the next couple of movies going forward, I'd be really exci- I was really ex- going to be excited to see where they were going to go with it. But um, yeah, in the three years since then, not much has happened since then. Uh, that celestial thing that we saw at the end of Eternals has never been mentioned again in any of the other MCU movies. It's like it never even existed. Like, okay, so are you, get, are you guys going to bring that up at any point in time? It's never been mentioned up. I was shocked that it wasn't even brought up in Deadpool and Wolverine. That's how much I was shocked it was that they've completely abandoned that idea altogether. 
So yeah, it definitely had a lot of notable flaws to it, especially in the second half, which you can definitely tell was made post-COVID. It was a thing that they tried. I think they really ran out of ideas that they were setting up in general, yeah, and it just fell apart in the second half. Of, you know, you have people that become villains for no particular reason. It goes on way too long. The editing gets terrible. The acting can be really forced and hammed up at times. Like it, the deviants were terrible to look at. I mean, it was a bad movie. It was a really, really bad movie. It's definitely up there with some of the worst MCU movies. I didn't think of that at the beginning, but it's definitely a movie that isn't going to re. It's definitely one of those movies that I look back on and I think maybe I was a little too nice to that movie. So, so I thought so maybe with the second movie, if they ever make it, because they did say at the end, the Eternals will return. Maybe they can fix the problems, but um, yeah, I've got some bad news for you. It started off with a story in, within Variety, but Cosmic Book News, which is a website that you don't usually want to trust in. That's one of those places that they're online, and they usually are more wrong most of the time. And um, and uh, let me see if I can find that story here. It's on here. It's basically, um, essentially, they're saying that Marvel is not developing an Eternal sequel. And they say, it's three strikes, you're out. Well, it was out for an Eternal sequel right away, but for the third time, it says no. It said no Eternals 2 is happening. The first Eternals bonded the box office with both the critics and the fans. Recently saw Kevin Feige confirm there's no immediate plans for Eternals 2, which followed claims that Disney CEO Bob Iger says Eternals 2 would be a guaranteed flop. Now Variety weighs in and says Marvel is reportedly not developing a sequel. News comes from Variety reporting on Kit Harrington discussing his MCU role. I'm not going to pretend I took that role because it was different and interesting. If Marvel calls, you got to do it. Harrington told GQ about playing Dane Whitman, a.k.a. the Black Knight. The Eternals post credit scene was supposed to set up Kit Harrington appearing in Blade alongside Mahershala Ali. However, Blade has been pushed on the back, back runner and is presently getting retold. And let's be honest, it's probably not going to happen at this point. But, um, but they still haven't canceled it yet. It wasn't mentioned at D23. But, um... But let, yeah, let me go back. Let me see if I can get to the variety story because they're not really saying anything in particular that's that noticeable here. Let me go here and see. Is there anything more here from this? So this is from the variety story. The post credit sequence for Eternals teased Dane becoming Black Knight in an upcoming Blade movie. While Eternals ended with a note suggesting the characters will return for a sequel, the Chloe Zahal directed Tentpole was a box office disappointment with $402 million worldwide, well below Marvel standards. Marvel was reportedly not developing a sequel at the time. Meanwhile, the Mahushala Ali starring Blade movie that, that Harrington's Black Knight was being teed up for has gone through multiple overhauls. It's unclear what the future holds for Harrington at Marvel. And I think that's about it. So bottom line, Eternals exists for no particular reason. A movie that was basically setting itself up for all these possibilities, all this story that they were building up. And as we've seen, it's leading up to nothing. And it's now officially leading up to nothing because the sequel is not happening anytime soon. And like I said before, there's a good reason why that is. Because the movie, when you really look back on it was not good to begin with because yeah it's not a good movie at all it's a movie that it's like i said the first half of the movie was really the strongest part of the movie it was taking chances it actually did some things that were unusual for a marvel movie up to that point going from more mature and adult themes to it i mean there's characters that there's characters that actually bang in this movie there's characters who are written as gay characters that are written that aren't written as look at us we're the flamboyant gay characters we're just characters no they're just characters and yeah, that was all in the most of it was in the first half of the movie, and the second half of the movie is where the problems come into play. And it really did feel like they ran out of ideas in the second half of the movie and just said, "This is a Marvel movie. We need a villain for these characters to fight, so let them fight with themselves." And they pulled the double crossing villain cliche with not just one, but two of the characters, and it goes about as you think it would. It's a lame, cliched riddle attempt to create a bad guy, and there's nothing unique or interesting about the characters' motivations whatsoever. They only do it because their beliefs are so set in stone that they refuse to see reason, and that's the only reason they're the antagonist. And if anything, the Deviants probably should have been the main villains in general, even though they look terrible. But they're just... I mean, they literally just look like a ton of scribbles thrown together, and they were made into a creature. They look so bad. Some of the visual ideas of it are kind of cool, but just the way they look, it looked like the laziest, laziest type of... Creation, creating characters I've ever seen before. 
And yeah, the editing can be very sloppy too, and it's a long movie. Like, Avengers Endgame has a reason to be as long as it needs to be, because it's the end of an over-decade-long storyline and the second part of a two-part story, so it makes sense for that film to be three plus to be three hours long. This movie did not need to be two and a half hours long, and it drags on like crazy. Like, it really did feel like the second half of the movie, that bubble just went out, and they were just scrambling to f find whatever they could find to just pad the runtime out. And it just, it didn't work per at all. I don't know if it was because Chloe Zayhao just couldn't handle the pressure of directing a big blockbuster so early in her career, or mostly because of what happened with COVID. I mean, COVID really ruin everything for the MCU in general and kind of change their game plan altogether and they had to change things around to keep everything within a safe distance and they just really ran out of ideas and threw shit at the wall and just said anything sticking? No, just keep trying like I don't know, like it's a shame too it's, overall it's a disappointment when you think about it because at the first half of the movie they were setting up things that they weren't doing that they didn't have, were doing in the MCU before that point and you expected so much more from but then in the second half it's just like they just went back to the basics and it just fell apart completely after that do i still think it do i think it's a bad movie yeah i'm not going to lie like i said the first half is still the strongest parts of the film but at the same time it's nothing that i'm going to say is going to be something that you need to see like if it shows up on fx or F or freeform in the next couple of weeks and months i'd say watch the first half and then once they get to the point where they start revealing the double the double twist villain and the villain and it just kind of skip away go watch something else but other than that though yeah it's a major letdown especially with everything they were setting up for these movies going forward and now it's not happening anymore and the celestial thing has become completely null and void i think they're in captain america brave new world just to be there to kind of end that storyline which they're probably just going to destroy it so yeah, it just serves no... The whole... Eternals basically serve no purpose whatsoever with anything going forward, but... But, yeah, it's just... That was the story I wanted to bring up because it was just basically confirmed that Eternals 2 is no longer happening, thus making Eternals completely null and void, and everything they're setting up, never gonna happen. Like, I would not be surprised if in the coming weeks and months we find out that that Blade movie's not happening. If they're... If, if they can't even get a director to stick around for it, then it's not a good sign going forward for that particular film. I'm just saying... It just isn't. So uh, so with that said, I think we're done on that front there. But let's go ahead and get to some recommendations. And we can go ahead and get on out of here. So it's kind of a slow new release week. We had all the big new releases last week with If, The Bike Riders, and uh, Furiosa and Mad Max Saga. And we won't have anything until next week when we've got Kingdom of the Planet of the Apes and the Garfield movie coming out. So I wanted to use this recommendations week to talk about the works of Jenna Rollins, who uh, uh, sadly passed away this week on, uh, I believe, uh, Wednesday. She died of complications from Alzheimer's disease at the age of 94 years old. And, um, you know, she, you know, she, she had been out of Hollywood for a number of years, but she is an actor. She's one of Hollywood's great actresses, a four-time Emmy and two-time Golden Globe winner who collaborated with her husband. Been John Cassavetes for 10 of her films, including A Woman Under the Influence and Gloria, which both earned her Oscar nominations. Uh, she also appeared in films like Woody Allen's Another Woman. She also appeared in Nick, son Nick Cassavetes' The Notebook, which is probably the movie that most people will remember her for. And um, she did receive, end up receiving an honorary Academy Award for her unique screen performances in 2015. And uh, she's been in a lot of movies that you should definitely check out. A Woman Under the Influence, uh, Two Minute Warning is a great movie you should definitely check out. Opening Night, which we talked about a, a couple years ago on Time About the Movies, is definitely one you should definitely check out. Gloria, uh, uh, I'm trying to see what else here. Tempest is another good one. Um, uh, of course, The Notebook is another one you should definitely check out. The Mighty, uh, let's see. There is one Jenna Rollins movie that I want to bring up because it's definitely one of my favorite underrated comedies in general. And it was a movie that came out in a year that I thought was actually a really good year for comedies in general in 1991. And it was actually early on in the year as well. And that's a movie called Once Around. And it starred, uh, it starred uh, Holly Hunter as a young woman who falls for it and eventually marries an overbearing older man played by Richard Dreyfuss who proceeds to rub her close-knit family the wrong way with the, while exposing the dynamics of other family members along the way. You also have uh, Danny Aiello, Rollins, and Lars von Giacomo among the cast in this film. And it's a really good movie that did get a lot of attention when it came out. It was a film that was dumped in the January months. But um, 
it's a really good movie that I do recommend checking out. It's a very underrated film from Lassie Holstrom, who did uh, Life is a Do- My Life is a Dog, and also did The Cider House Rules, Chocolat, An Unfinished Life, Casanova, The Hoax, just a lot of different movies of his. Um, great score by James Horner. It's a really good underrated movie, and it's a movie I highly recommend checking out if you haven't seen it. It's definitely worth finding out there. I think it's available on Blu-ray recently. It just came out on Blu-ray through... Milk Week, if I'm not mistaken. If you can find it, you can find it at a reasonable price. I definitely recommend checking it out if you can find it out there. But that's one I definitely recommend checking out uh, once around. Uh, rest in peace, Jenna Rollins, who died at 94 this week. Uh, other than that, though, that's going to wrap up this episode of the Reviewing Network Live. Thank you so much for watching and listening. And if you want to see more videos like this and hear more videos like this, uh, please hit our like and subscribe button. Check out some of the other episodes we've done with last week's episode up at the corner, as well as our playlist. And, um, and we post here every Sunday night. We post new videos here every week as well, including Time About the Movies Clipless versions. We're just about to head into 2002 in about a couple of days. And um, trailer reactions coming out as well, as well as other videos coming down the road. So hopefully you can jo- watch those videos and enjoy. We're getting a lot of viewers coming to the channel every, t- every time now, thanks to those videos. So I hope you've been enjoying th- those videos as well as these as well. And... Um, Hopefully, you'll find, hopefully we can keep entertaining you in, in, over the course of the next months, coming weeks, months, years, and co- years and more. So, so anyway, that's going to wrap this up. So thank you very much for watching the Reviewing Network Live this week. I'll see you guys next Sunday night. And until then, thanks for watching, and we are out.